So again, we talked about producing energy from fuel, and the whole point was I use some sort of fuel and I put it into the power station. Whether it's fossil fuels, whether it's nuclear, it goes into the power station. You boil water, right? So you take H2O liquid to H2O gas, and that gaseous water, that steam, turns a turbine, and that turbine forces electrical power to be generated, and that goes out where we're going, right? Renewable energy sources we're not talking about in any way today. We're talking about using nuclear as the way to boil water instead of fossil fuels. So remember we use those control rods in a power plant to control how many neutrons get out, but eventually we just run out of fuel. There's no more uranium-235 left in there to fission, but there's plenty of other stuff, right? Remember, we said that the products were barium nuclei and potassium nuclei. Those are themselves radioactive. These are not the um, most comfortable uh, positions of these particular things. So for example, barium-138-56, might decay, it might give away an alpha particle. So it would be 134, 52, plus 42 He, right? 134 plus 4 makes 138, 52 plus 2, or sorry, that should be 54 plus 2 makes helium. And if we go look at the periodic table, Right? Fission products themselves undergo radioactive decay. We might get alpha decay, beta decay, gamma decay, there's all sorts of options. But they're decaying and they're giving off alpha particles, beta particles, gamma particles. Why is that important? Well, they stick around, right? And we know that radiation is bad. I mean, alpha radiation isn't terrible for you. A piece of paper will do it, but beta, you need lead sheeting for protection. For gamma, you really need to make a big container that's isolated from the rest of the world. What are we interested in? We need to know how long this stuff is going to stick around. Is this a couple of days and it's ready to be re released? Is this more than that? We need to know what kind of particles are getting released so that we can help evaluate what's going on, right? If it's alpha, I don't have to be so concerned. If it's gamma, then I had better be worried. So let's take a look at this time of decay, at this half-life. We use the symbol T1 half to symbolize half-life, and all it is is the time required for a half of a radioactive sample to decay. So for example, phosphorus 32, so 32P, is a radioactive nucleus. This is one that actually gets used in medicine, for example. Um, if you've ever had a PET test, they've given you some form of phosphorus 32, and they're following the decay, the beta decay, of phosphorus 32. And let's say that I start with 16 grams of phosphorus 32. The half-life of phosphorus 32 is 14 days. So that's the T1 half. So that means that after 14 days, I've gone down to 50% of what I started with. So I've got 8 grams. After another 14 days, I'm down to 4 grams, and then down to 2 grams. Every time I go through a half-life, I decrease what I had by 2. So after 3 half-lives, I've gone down a half, a half, and a half again, and I'm down to 2. That's all there is to a half-life. The most important thing to know about half-lives is it's independent of the amounts of sample. So if I started with 16 grams of phosphorus 32, I'd have 2 grams at the end of uh, 3 half-lives. If I started with 100 grams of phosphorus 32, then I'd go down to 50, I'd go down to 25, I'd go down to 12.5 grams. It's still decayed by half every time. It doesn't matter how much I could start with. I could start with 10 trillion kilograms and it'd still work the same way. What about pressure? It's not like I can pressurize nuclear waste or I could try to put it in the gas phase to depressurize it. It doesn't matter. The T1 half is the T1 half. The only thing that it does depend on is the identity of the sample. If I have 32 phosphorus, I've got to wait 14 days for it to decay down by half. That's the only factor that I consider. What about nuclear fuel, though? Right? Nuclear fuel contains radioactive isotopes that are going to be giving uh, giving out uh, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma particles. And we have to categorize them in different ways. So we have several different ones. We have low-level radioactive, radioactive waste, or LLW. That's about 90% of every radioactive waste that gets generated in the world. 
small quantities of radioactive things. Uh, contaminated clothing, so if you've worked in a place with uh, lots of exposure to radioactive uh, supplies, your clothing is contaminated and is LLW. Your tools might be as well. Smoke detectors are also LLW. Smoke detectors work using a radioactive isotope of uh, the element americium. And so your smoke detector is actually very, very low level radioactive waste. It's alpha particle based, right? You don't have to be worried about that radioactivity anytime soon. The smoke detector is more than enough to shield you from the alpha particles. What about the next category up? There's high level radioactive waste, HLW. This is some stuff that we have to be a little bit more careful about, right? Toxic chemicals are in there and radioactive chemicals. So toxic chemicals, there might be heavy metals, for example, as well as radioactive in that sample. The only thing you can do for high-level radioactive waste, like spent fuel rods, for example, is to wait, which is a tricky prospect. High-level radioactive waste with all of that radioactive material, most of that radioactive material does not have the half-life of medical isotopes, right? Medical isotopes like phosphorus or iodine, their half-lives are on the order of days or weeks. High-level radioactive waste usually has a half-life on the order of years. And all you can do is isolate it from the environment as best you can and wait. That makes things a security risk, right? What happens if somebody uh, breaks in and steals that radioactive waste? You could use it as something bad. What happens if the container breaks and leaches radioactive, envi uh, radioactive materials into the environment? And so right now, for example, what we've got in nuclear plants are really big pools. And those pools have all of the uh, radioactive waste sunk into them, and they are isolated from the environment as best as they can. They've talked off and on about uh, building a radioactive storage site at Yucca Mountain, which is this nice A site in Nevada. And you can imagine uh, the reaction of the uh, people in the general vicinity, even though there's not much out there. Anybody who is close doesn't like that idea very much. But the bottom line is, all you can do is wait, and all you can do is maintain the things as best you can. Check out your book. They have some signage that they've started to create for radioactive waste. What happens in 10,000 years when the English language has changed very much, and our civilization is no longer here, and people can't read our notices about nuclear waste? What do we have to do? They've tried to play around with making signs that people could understand no matter what their level of education in 10,000, 20,000 years because this stuff is a risk. Last uh, categorization of radioactivity and radioactive waste is spent nuclear fuel. So uh, that's your uranium or your plutonium from uh, making nuclear control rods. and. Uh, this is civil or military origin. So for example, uh, there are radioactive uh, submarines, or, or not radioactive submarines, but nuclear submarines that run and they power themselves off of uh, nuclear power. And those control rods have to have something done with them. These are regulated as high level nuclear waste. One more thing, let's take a look at the outlook for nuclear power. What are the risks and benefits and what are the problems that need to be solved to uh, continue using it? So what are the benefits of nuclear power? The bottom line is it's more power for less resources. I told you yesterday in the last lecture that uh, the energy released by just 2.2 pounds of uranium is about a million times larger than the energy released by the same amount of uh, octane. So more bang for your buck is important. We have very high energy demands in the world and providing for those is going to be very vital and critical going forward. I told you at the very start of Chapter 7 that this is not a combustion-based uh, power, um, and so we don't have CO2 emissions or SO2 emissions. That drastically cuts down on contributions to global warming, and it drastically cuts down on contributions to acid rain if we can cut down those two gases. What about uh, the other things that get emitted? Nuclear power gives very, very small emission rates of heavy metals, ash, or radioactives. Remember, we have those closed loops. We don't have soot or smoke being released from nuclear power. And coal mines are safety and health risks. I don't know if you've ever heard the stories of the coal mines, but they're not friendly places to work, and they're not friendly places to breathe or live. What about the drawbacks? Well, you've got to process and handle the fuel, and to do that you need power, and our power at this point still depends on burning coal. And so you're still having CO2 emissions, you're costing CO2 emissions to make the fuel rods. 
Now that can change later when power is more from nuclear, but for now you're still emitting CO2 to get there. It's kind of like the biofuels problem from our last chapter. Another big drawback is that high-level nuclear waste. What do you have to do with that? How can we take care of that responsibly? What about mill waste and mining spills? Right? What happens if I uh, release some uranium into the environment? Do I have to be concerned about that? The price tag of nuclear power is a lot higher. The fuel is much more expensive to mine and much more expensive to process. And the reactors, because they have to be so precise, because they have to be so controlled, are very, very expensive. What about uranium mines themselves? Well, they're not much better than coal mines. They have their own safety and health risks, and so we have to t figure out how to keep personnel safe. And of course, the, most, the one that we're most familiar with is the potential for huge disasters with nuclear power plants. When's the last time you heard about a coal plant and a major disaster to coal plant? And on the other hand, things like Chernobyl, and this is a particular radiation count uh, at the Chernobyl plant, which is way higher than humans should be able to withstand 30 years later. Or more recently, the Fukushima uh, disaster after the earthquake in Japan in 2011. When nuclear goes bad, it goes very bad. Now that being said, disasters don't happen as often. These things are engineered to be very, very careful and to be very, very uh, circumspect about what's going on. But those disasters still live on in our minds, and so the public perception stays very low. How could we make this a more viable fuel option, a source of uh, energy that's better for us and better for the environment, but still safe for everybody? Well, one thing to do is to run reactors at higher temperatures. If you can make your steam hotter, you can more efficiently convert uh, your uh, convert steam to power, basically. Um, what about trade-offs to reduce material damage, right? You want to keep from re um, damaging your reactor, right? The hotter the steam is, the more likely you are to destroy the material that the reactor is built in, and so you have to make the reactor more impervious to temperature changes. The, bigger, the biggest concern for nuclear is figuring out how to reprocess or better store the waste. If I have a spent fuel rod, is there any way that I can reprocess that to use it again or to use it for something else? Is there something better than just burying it in the ground and hoping nothing happens? Because nuclear reactors and because um, the actual fuel have high, high price tags, nuclear is actually a little bit more expensive of an energy to distribute. And so you need to find a way to distribute that price without charging the consumers for it. Are there tax breaks that go in here? Do we simply make the power plants take a hit for the first few years while they're making it cheaper? What's going on there? Lastly, the thing that has to be done to make nuclear more viable for any of the first things to happen is to improve public opinion. Because of Chernobyl, because of Fukushima, we have many people who are very squirrely and very nervous about nuclear power and they take the not in my backyard approach that this is not going to happen near me it might be okay somewhere else but I don't want to see it and so without that public opinion of improvement improvement without public education none of the other things can happen but the bottom line is we are going to run out of coal we are going to run out of oil those things take millions of years to regenerate and we don't have that kind of time and so things like nuclear will have to come in to fill the gap in order to uh, continue providing us with our energy demands.